So uh, this is a series of ideas based on research that have come out in the last three years that has completely changed the way I think about visualization. And uh, if you're familiar with Donald Knuth, he's one of the fathers of modern computer science, and he made an observation that I think is very astute. And what he said is that science is anything we understand well enough to explain to a computer, and everything else is art. And for the last 10 or 20 years, visualization has been largely bound up in art. And there's nothing wrong with art, but it is the domain of subjective opinions, and I don't like pie charts, and I think we should use yellow, and let's use this other font. And in the next five to 10 years, I, I think we're gonna see this fundamental paradigm shift in moving from visualizations that are evaluated by human beings to visualizations that are evaluated by computers and visualizations that are co-designed between people and computers. And in order to reach that world, we have to use the language of clarity and the language of rigor, or said another way, we have to speak in a language that computers understand. And that language is mathematics. So this talk will be a little bit dense. Uh, it's definitely mathematical, but I'm gonna pepper it with examples throughout. And the carrot, or the pot of gold on the other side of this, if you can survive a little bit of mathematics, we can all live in a world where computers can help us design our visualizations and save us from stupid debates on the whiteboard about who likes this and who likes that, right? So using a priori principles, mathematical principles, we can objectively judge which visualizations are better than others and which visualizations are clearer than others. All right, so I'm gonna draw heavily on a framework that was published in 2014 by Kindleman and Scheidegger called an algebraic process for visualization design. Whenever you see brackets, that's a citation. At the end of my talk, I'll share all of my sources with you. I'll make these slides available to Anna as well. All right, there are three properties of a clear visualization. They are invariance, unambiguity, and correspondence. We're gonna go through examples of all of these, and these are not heuristics. These are mathematical principles that you can explain to a computer. Let's go through it. So the idea behind invariance is that you have the same data always produces the same visualization. It seems very obvious. In practice, it happens very rarely. So here's the thing to get. These two, P these two visualizations here show exactly the same data, but the visualizations themselves are in fact substantially different. And this is what we're going to call a hallucination in visualization. I'll give you a mathematical definition for this in a moment. But the purpose of this graphic is show, to show the difference in genders in senior management. So orange is the percentage of women in senior management, blue is a percentage of men, and now here's the real crime of this visualization. It shows the same data, but because of an arbitrary decision made by the designer, you will draw entirely different conclusions from this data. So when the shape of the data changes, the shape of the understanding that you derive from that visualization changes, we're gonna see how to fix this in just a moment. Here's another example. These are pickups and drop-offs. You can imagine that this is a heat map that somebody like Uber would generate. So it is the same data in both visualizations. However, the top visualization gives us the impression that the map is dominated by pickups. The bottom visualization gives us the impression that the map is dominated by drop-offs. Both of these impressions are a hallucination. Here again, we have two different, we have the same population and we've taken two different samples. You cannot now look at this line chart and nobody would guess, even if they squinted really hard, that both of these graphs come from the same underlying population. Again, we have hallucination. These are hedgehog plots here. They're both designed to visualize the same underlying vector field. It's the same data input into both visualizations, but they, for some reason, a reason that we're gonna explore in just a moment, look different. So this is what we call hallucination, and in mathematics, this is when an operator is ill-defined. So we have a single piece of data, a single pre-image, which generates two different projections, two distinct visualizations. Let's look at how we can fix that here. So the data visualization on the bottom displays this property that we're looking for, which is invariance. And on the bottom, what is it that is different about the bottom visualization from the hallucinations on top? What is it that makes that visualization work better? Where is equality between men and women in the bottom visualization? It's on the diagonal line, on the 45 degree line now. Here's the kicker. The position of the marks in the lower visualization is completely determined by the data itself. There's no arbitrariness. No matter how you shuffle the orders of the countries in this visualization, they will all land in the same location. And this is really the key to understanding this whole talk is that if we have a semantic that is in the visualization that is not in the data set, we will have a distortion. So countries, the United States, New Zealand, Great Britain, Ireland, are drawn from a set. 
Sets do not have an inherent order, but what the designer has done on the top is impose some arbitrary order. Oh, because I'm from America, I'm going to put the USA first. That is a completely arbitrary decision, and it leads to a distortion in the data. Whereas on the bottom, no matter how I shuffle the order of the countries, they will always appear in the same location. Is that clear? OK, super. So here again, what did we do to fix the bottom visualization? This is proper sampling technique here. So instead of just being at the whims of the rendering order of the computer or the input order of our data set, we're actually able to sample and find out what the density of pickups and drop-offs is in each location. Let's look at this a little bit differently. So here's the way to understand this, is that the intersection, intersection is a commutative operation, right? If I have a Venn diagram, okay, if I have pickups overlapped with drop-offs, that is the same as, as drop-offs overlapped with pickups. But rendering is not commutative. Let's look at that a little bit more deeply here. So yellow over blue is different than blue over yellow. If you use transparency, that it's considerably less obvious. How many classes do we want to represent in this problem? How many? There should be three classes in this problem, right? Pickups, drop-offs, and the intersection of the two. There's three classes. However, we are hallucinating a fourth class. And that hallucination is a function of the fact that rendering is not commutative, so yellow over blue does not produce the same color as blue over yellow. So that is what we call hallucination due to transparency in a scatter plot. Let's look at how we can fix that. So you have a couple of options here. So one is you use a commutative blending function, use a custom blending function, or you use sampling, which we saw in the prior example there. And the idea is captured in this 2013 paper on splatter plots. I, I know this is super dense, guys, but it's, it's information that most people are not familiar with yet, and I promise to make all these slides available online and to show you some more constructive examples. So the idea here on the far left, if you do the naive thing and you use an RGB color space, your brain will tend to think that the areas of overlap with blue belong more to the blue region because blue hues tend to dominate in RGB space. If we use a perceptual color space, like LAB, in the middle, we get better results. And finally, on the far right, with lightness attenuation, we have a scatter plot which is free from hallucination because the rendering order doesn't matter, and we have represented the colors in such a way that they all get equal mind share when you look at that visualization. Here again, what do we do to transform the data on top? The, remember, this is the same underlying data set. The visualizations on top look very different. What did we do on the bottom to make the visualizations look similar? This is just smoothing or kernel density estimation, right? So when we draw from a very large sample population, we would be wise to reconstruct the underlying probability distribution. We get a much smoother outcome, closer to hallucination free on the bottom. Here again, with our hedgehog plot, what we do instead of placing glyphs at regular, the glyphs are just those little arrows there. Instead of placing them at regular intervals, what we do is we ensure that the space between them is equal and we get the hallucination free on the bottom there. So hallucination, again, is when we have the same data, but it produces two substantially different visualizations. And this is an affront to the truth, if you think about it, because two people looking at the same data should derive the same or similar understandings. Let's look at how we fix that. So the place to look for hallucinators is in sampling, sorting, and projection. And we can talk more about this in detail if you have any questions towards the end. So that's invariance at a high level. The next property we're gonna look at is something called unambiguity. Weird word, but this is the word that was used in the paper and I'm gonna stick with it. It has a very, very simple idea. And it says that if the data changes, the visualization should change. Now this is in some sense the dual, the logical dual of the first property, which says that if the data doesn't change, the visualization should not change. So here, if we have different data, we should produce a different visualization. Let's look at some examples. So the beautiful thing about this framework is that it works for both human perceptual system and for visualization, right? So color blindness is an example where we have two distinct data points, but when they hit the retina, they're smashed into a single point. Okay? That's a form of something that we're going to cause call, call confusion, right? So here, if we choose to represent our data in red and green, respectively, we have two distinct data, two distinct percepts that map into the same stimuli, right? And what's happening here is a loss of dimensionality. People who are colorblind are missing a cone, right? So again, RGB, red, green, red, green, blue, which is the typical space that we draw in on a monitor, has three dimensions. The human visual system, if you're colorblind, only has two dimensions. And in the process of losing that dimension, we are losing the distinction between red and green. 
This is an example of a convolutional neural network. What was it trained to recognize? What does this neural network do for a living? I'm sorry? What does it recognize for a living? It recognizes dumbbells. But what you'll notice is that this machine is confused at the concept between arms and dumbbells. And if I were to show this classifier an arm, I would get what is called a false positive out the other end. Why is the machine confused between dumbbells and arms? That's the key point, right? So in the training set, the co-occurrence of arms and dumbbells is so high that the machine cannot distinguish those two concepts. So the point here, we can go more deeply into this later, the point here is that you can have confusion at the machine level or at the human level. This is conceptual confusion. This is a neat one. This is called Bas Relief Ambiguity. I really think that looks like Steve Jobs. It's not Steve Jobs. But on the far right, you will see that all of these geometries are profoundly different. Right? However, when you look at them head on, and if you move the lighting function to a location that offsets the geometric skew, all of these geometries rasterize identically. So here we have four substantially different geometries that look, in fact, the same when you render them in a computer. And you can replicate Bas Relief ambiguity in real life as well. Another example of confusion, different data, same appearance, right? Uh, if those of you are familiar with machine learning, we'll be familiar with tensors. These are simply high dimensional objects. And the idea here is that on the top, all of these tensors are substantially different. However, due to the phenomenon that we just saw, which is Bas Relief ambiguity, they look substantially similar. And that is confusion. Here again, different tree maps. The trees have different connectivity, but they generate the same tree map. Confusion again. Parallel coordinates plot two completely different data sets, but they generate the same plot. We're going to see how to fix this in just a moment. And a streamlined visualization. This is a visualization of a fluid simulation. And if I double the velocities in this simulation, do I have a different underlying data set, yes or no? If I change the velocities, has the data changed? Absolutely. So it should produce a different visualization. It does not. Uh, this is a really neat one here, and what I want to show you is that mathematical measures can be confused as well. So this just came out of Autodesk Research, and what I want you to watch on the far right, I'm going to play this again, is that every single one of these data sets, does everybody agree that these data sets are different? They are radically different, but they are confused. They produce the same mean and the same standard deviation in both dimensions, and they have the same Pearson coefficients, right? So here, statistical measures can be confused as well. And if you do not visualize your data in this case, and you only trust this dimension, which is known as the mean or the standard deviation, you will be confused and you will lose the distinction. You will lose the differences in the data. All right, so that's confusion. When different data produce the same result, let's look at how to fix that. Here again, we're going to choose a dimensionally appropriate representation. On the bottom, it's the visualization of the same data but we are able to reflect the difference better because we have a dimensionally appropriate technique. This is called super quadriglyphs. It doesn't really matter what it's called, but the important thing is that the visualization technique represents the dimensionality of the data and we don't get the confusion that we had earlier. Cushion tree maps. If you have two different trees, each with 16 nodes, what can be different between those two trees? We want the visualization to be different because the data is different, but the height of the nodes in the tree can be different. So in the cushion tree map, we use that lighting function to reflect how high the node is in the tree. Here again, parallel coordinates. Once we add color, we add the dimension of color back, we're actually able to distinguish between the two different data sets. Here again, line integral convolution. Now different data sets look different, which is what we want. And here, instead of having our statistical measure or being confused by our statistical measures, we can use visualization to see that these data sets are all radically different. And we should all be scared or we should all be alert to the fact that you can have data that are so different but produce the same representation. And again, that's what we call confusion. How do you fix that? You look for losses of gain or losses or gains of dimensionality. In sampling theory, we have something called aliasing. I can explain that later. And both confusion and hallucination can occur at the human or computer level. How many people have been trained that pie charts suck? Why? So I'm going to show you, and hopefully kill pie charts once and forever, the reason that pie charts are a problem is, OK, can everybody see here that the data are substantially different along the bottom looking at the bar charts? 
right? All the data sets are substantially different, but the pie chart confuses the fact why. Okay, you guys are really close. It's hard for your eyes to perceive the angle, and here's the thing. On the bottom, your eye is excellent at comparing the lengths of marks along a common baseline. Your eye is really, really good at that. But we just took a one-dimensional problem and screwed it up and threw it into two dimensions. That's why pie charts are a problem, because you're fundamentally trying to represent a unidimensional quantity, and just for kicks, because you think circles are pretty, you're representing it in two dimensions. That's the issue. All right, let's talk about correspondence here. So. Once you have invariance and unambiguity, you can build a correspondence. And this is the deep and the central part of this whole talk is that we want to build a visualization that effectively reflects changes to the data. That's the whole talk, okay? And I'm gonna give you some heuristic summaries in just a moment, but a little bit more uh, on the example side here. So what is different between these two graphs? Sorry? Yes, that's correct. There are more edges on the right. Uh, but unfortunately, and how many people use force-directed layouts in D3? Okay, great. So here's the problem with force-directed layouts. You can add one node and get a radically different change in the layout just by adding one node. And the issue here is that this, these are our directed acyclic graphs. And in both instances, if we topologically sort that graph, A should always come out on top. But the lack of correspondence that we have in here is if we add those edges, A loses its position in the graph. So in order to have a correspondent visualization, A should preserve its property, the property of the data, which is that A is the senior most node in the graph. Okay, that's an example of correspondence. I've got more coming. All right, uh, let's break this down a little bit here. So in order to be able to explain this to a computer, we have to do a little bit of math. There are three steps, the data, the representation, and the visualization. Representing data is not trivial at all. There's a saying that the menu is not the meal, okay? And the menu is the data in the real world, excuse me, the meal is the data in the real world, and the menu is the way you represent that in a computer or a Turing machine. You can have sampling error, modeling error, tractability bias, on and on and on. The very act of representing something in a computer is a distorting step, right? So you have the data, D, the representation, R, and the visualization, V. This is it. So what is the definition of visualization? The old definition of visualization is that it is a function which maps data into marks on a screen. The new definition of visualization is that a visualization is a functor, F-U-N-C-T-O-R, which maps changes in the data to changes in the visualization. That is the key point, okay? And the whole idea behind all this math is that a visualization which is accurate is isomorphic to the data. Now, it's a little bit difficult to understand. I had to read this paper four or five times before I got it, but here's the great thing. Now that we've done the math, we can have a computer do this work for us. I'm gonna show you some examples of that in just a minute. Uh, just to hit this from a different direction, let me jump right to the end here so we have more time for examples. All right, so this is the mathiest and most difficult part. This is called a commutative diagram. And the alpha on the far left there are questions that our users want to ask from the visualization. Who is the fastest man in the world? What would happen if, the pers if somebody ran a 100 meter dash one second faster than Usain Bolt? The alpha are the questions your users want to ask from the visualization. And the omega are the changes that those questions or those changes to the world should induce in the data set, okay? So as promised, let me see if I can take you now to some examples in Python which actually demonstrate this difference here, so. Uh, this is what I promised earlier, which is that we can use code to help us reason about the correctness of a visualization, right? So remember, a hallucinator is when you have the same data that produces different visualizations. So I'm just gonna generate some random data. I have two random plots, and what I'm changing between these two plots is the representation of the data. The only thing I am changing is I am shuffling the input data. Should shuffling the input data have any effect on what the visualization looks like? Absolutely not, it's the same data. All right, let's put these two things side by side and I will ask you, are these visualizations the same? Wow. Are these visualizations the same or are they different? Sorry? Uh, why are they different? 
That's right. Uh, some of you have very, very good eyes. So this is what we call small multiples or space multiplexing when we spread things out in space. We can also stack them in time. This is a technique that we learned from astronomy because astronomers have to look at huge images with millions of stars and look for a change in one star. So well, the reason it's hard to detect the difference up here is something called change blindness. If you're looking for the difference between these two visualizations, unless you have a Hawkeye, it's really hard to find. When we stack those visualizations in time, instead of stacking them in space, the changes jump out at us, right? And so remember, what are these points that are flashing? Exactly, those are precisely the hallucinations in our visualization. Those are the points at which rendering order matters. Now here's the big reveal. I can go to a computer and say, hey computer, render two different versions of this visualization, and then I'm gonna do something very simple. I'm just gonna ask the computer to tell me the difference between those two visualizations. And this, this, this difference, these are the areas of overlap, these are the areas where in the data set order shouldn't matter, but in the visualization order does matter. So I just used a computer to show me precisely where the hallucinations in my data set are. Let's look for confusers, same thing, right? So uh, we're gonna start from the beginning here. Remember, confusion is when you have, it's just like confusion in the real world. You have two different things that people can't tell apart, right? That's what gives you confusion. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is just generate some random data. Uh, I'm now gonna prove in Python that that data is in fact different here. So what this true says is that these are just triplets, X, Y, Z triplets. What this true says is that for every triplet, the Z coordinate is always different. So my question to you, are these two data sets that we've just generated different? Hello? Are the data sets different? They are, I just proved to you they're different, right? So we know the Z coordinates are different. Now, we're gonna run into confusion when we show that unfortunately the visualizations are the same, right? So I'm gonna plot these two visualizations, um, and don't mind me, there's something weird about the order that Python works in, but now we're gonna do a blink comparator over these two visualizations. Are they different? Uh, let's try that one more time. Okay, good. So, two different data sets. Are the visualizations different when we stack them in time? Really hard to tell. Uh, if you actually do a diff, they will be different even though not substantially, and that's just spray due to anti-aliasing. Now, if we reorder the columns, which is the way to correct this visualization, it's because of this single point, this degeneracy, that we lose information. So, if we run a blink comparator on the corrected visualization, are the visualizations different? And should they be different? They should be, because we know that the data are different. Um, I'm gonna show you one more example, correspondence, and then I'm gonna take time for questions. A quick plug for what we do. So our startup Quilt is a data package manager, and as Ben mentioned, one of the biggest problems in data visualization is getting clean data. So you'll notice that the way I get clean data into this notebook is I simply Quilt install my data set, right? Each data set on Quilt has a page, and if I want the men's world 100 meter dash Olympic records, I can get it on Quilt. And I just do a quick install, and I immediately load it into code. There's no cleaning, there's no parsing. That data package is ready to roll. So let's look at how we actually use that. Uh, you'll notice here, again, there's no data cleaning code. As soon as I reference it, um, there, I've got world 100 meter dash data and I can visualize it. Now, I'm gonna show you two different visualizations of the same data. And the first question, let's look at the data set a little bit and get an intuitive understanding for it. So this is Usain Bolt, okay? This is about 100 years of men improving their time in the 100 meter dash. And if you look at so notice the time has gone in about 100 years from 10.6 seconds to 9.6 seconds, okay? So my question for you, and this will be an alpha in our algebraic visualization process design, would it be significant if somebody beat the world record time by one second? It would be, it'd be life-changing. That person would have cheated and was probably on steroids, right? So let's look at this now. So look at these two visualizations. Which visualization would make it easier to see if somebody beat the 100 meter dash time by one second? Would you even see it in the visualization on the left? You'd barely see it, you'd see like a little tiny dip here, right? So this is an, again an example of how we can use computers to help us detect which visualizations are most likely to give us accurate results. Uh, there's a lot to this, there's a lot more to it. I've started a couple open source projects 
that I hope will help others to contribute this. I, I want to do a couple of, of fun puzzles for you uh, before we split here. Uh, let's try that one more time. All right, so these are all visual puzzles here. Oh, real quick, right? So we, it's not all math. There are three very simple questions you can ask yourself to improve visualization. So one, is there anything in the visualization that's not in the data? If we see something that's not there, that's a hallucination. Two, is there anything in the data that's not in the visualization? That's confusion. And finding, finally, does the visualization reflect meaningful changes to the data set? These are the GitHub repositories. I'll make these slides available online. I don't expect you to write those URLs down. Uh, a couple of fun tricks for you here. So we have six visualizations here. Five of them show random data. One of them shows real data. Which one shows real data? Yeah, why? OK, so the guess was four. Any other guesses? Yeah, three. OK, so the answer is three. And here's the reason why. That is the only one where you can actually see a gradient. And you can actually see a correlation between cancer rates, which this is supposed to show, and geography. So this is a way of detecting. It's called a lineup, like a criminal lineup. And you're looking for the suspect. This is a way of detecting which, whether or not you've picked a visualization that accurately reflects the changes in your data. Let's do one more. This, these are flight delay times as a function of wind direction in Phoenix Airport. Which one of these is real data? Four, why? Four is the only one that shows a directional tendency, which was what you would expect from the wind, right? Um, this is a neat one here. Which one of these is real data? Anybody? Eight? OK, so the answer is they're all fake. And uh, this is called a Rorschach test. And people have something called apophenia, which is they like to see patterns where there are none. So this is another, for lack of a better word, shit test of your visualizations to see if, you're, if people are telling fake stories or there's actual meaningful changes in the data. Uh, final thing I want to show you is the visualization that you choose reflects the clarity of that visualization. So on the top, it's kind of hard. We have confusion. Different data sets look about the same. On the bottom, doesn't it just scream out at you? You see that box plot in number four? So the visualization technique that we choose has a very strong effect on the accuracy of our perceptions that we derive from it. Uh, as I mentioned, I know the talk is super dense. Uh, you can find more of these talks online. Uh, this is the bibliography. I'll make sure the slides are available. And if you have any questions or comments, you can find me on Twitter. You can hit me up over email. And if you're working in data science and you want hashed reproducible data packages, check out quiltdata.com. That's the whole talk. And I'm happy to take your questions. So uh, great talk, first of all. Uh, really thought-provoking. I guess I'm trying to apply it to cartography, which is my domain. Um, and I see a lot of cartography that is technically correct, but um, I don't know if misguided is the right word, but un unfortunate choices, for instance, in symbology, you can tell them apart. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it, it the Cartography, for instance, is very flat, hasn't been thought out to show the point that the, that the cartographer is trying to express in the map. And so I'm wondering if, if the methods that you're, you're discussing could be used to check, um, and this is the, the, maybe the subjective part of it, but if you, for instance, I'll make up an example. If you know that there's a strong correlation between, between two variables, you're trying to demonstrate in your, your map or your plot that correlation, and you choose you know, unfortunate colors that obscure that. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm trying to ask, to what degree are you know, the data, the, the kind of higher level understanding coming from the data scientist able to influence, or should they influence cartography, uh. given this 
set up. Okay, so uh, the question was regarding cartography, so I switched to this cartogram here. And uh, the question is, what should the data scientist's insight into the data set influence how the visualization is designed? And the answer is absolutely yes. So if we remember that commutative diagram, that box that we saw, the thing not to fight about anymore is, is this the right visualization? Do you like pie charts? Which font should we use? Let's use blue. No, I like green. The thing that people should be arguing about now is what are the questions the users want to ask from the data? Once we know the answer to that question, we can objectively measure and objectively determine which visualization technique under which parameters produces the most accurate visualization. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yes. So I have a visualization that's not working very well right now. Um, and um, we code more and more into it to try to make it work better. Um, is there a like hierarchical checklist to go, what do the users need to see in this data? If they need to see X, show Y. Uh -huh. So the question, he has a visualization right now, which is a little bit difficult to make more accurate or make clearer. He wants to know if there's a visual checklist that he can go through. Um, that's really the realm of Tufti and Stephen Few. There are lots of design guidelines. Uh, this semantic debugger for visualizations that I want to build does not exist yet. I hope that within a year we will have progress on that. Um, but I would start with the very high level uh, interpretation of this talk, which is are changes in the data reflected in the visualization? That's, it really only boils down to, we'll just roll back here, it really only boils down to those three questions, right? So, I mean, that's where I would start. And I think this approach is substantially different than most other approaches you'll find out there. And also, you know, start in a locally optimal place. Use sensible design. All right, well, I'll be around at drinks tonight. Um, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and happy to talk to you later.